save the best until last. So I would like you to welcome our closing keynote speaker, Jim Zemlin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for staying around. Um, I was a little frustrated originally when O'Reilly asked me to give a keynote uh, because of this whole alphabetical order policy here. <laughs> screws me. Every time I get the last spot. Uh, today I want to talk about Linux, about where Linux has been in the past decade or so, but more importantly about where Linux is going in the future. Um, and so to start that conversation, I thought it would be interesting to look back a few years about where Linux started to really take off. And one of the best examples I could find from early days of Linux really breaking through into the mainstream was uh, a favorite advertisement uh, that ran as a Super Bowl advertisement uh, back in 2001. And I thought I would share that with you all today just to see how far we have come. It's just a kid. This is a G chord. He's learning, absorbing. He's getting smarter every day. Homo habilis was the first to use tools. A player who makes a team great is more valuable than a great player. Losing yourself in the group for the good of the group, that's teamwork. It's happening fast. We've always watched the stars. If you look at the sky, you can see the beginning of time. Collecting data is only the first step toward wisdom, but sharing data is the first step toward community. Poetry. There's not much glory in poetry, only achievement. Knowledge and education. What he learns, we all learn. What he knows, we all benefit from. One little thing can solve an incredibly complex problem. Everything's about timing, kid. This is business. Faster, better, cheaper. Constant improvement. So, you want to fly, huh? Wing speed, thrust. It's physics. Res publica non domine tu. Plummet. It's all about the tools. Speak your mind. Don't back down. Does he have a name? Free advertisement for IBM there, but a great ad nonetheless to think about that little kid as symbolic of sort of the beginning of Linux and then to see just how far Linux has gone today. Today, everybody in the modern world uses Linux multiple times a day, even if they don't know it, to do a Google search, to trade stock on the New York Stock Exchange, to use an ATM machine, to read a book, to use their laptop. It's just amazing to think how prolific Linux has become across every category of computing. Today, Linux is the fastest growing platform in every single category of computing, from small embedded systems to mobile devices to new small netbooks, PCs, server, and in supercomputing as well, and high-performance computing as well. It wasn't long ago, about that same period of time, I think we're going to get some help backstage here with the uh, next slide, please. Uh, at that same period of time, this was another organization that was talking about open source and Linux. Same, about the same time that advertisement ran, we saw this quote. And this uh, also gives us an example of how far we've come just this week with open source. This was uh, back in, in 2001, and now we're, we're here where Microsoft is actually participating in the community. So suffice to say, we've, we've come a long way. But you know, when I was working on this, I, I kept asking myself, that little kid, what? Does anybody here know whatever ended up happening to that little kid? Wikipedia. Wikipedia. You're close. Actually, it, it, it's not. He, he really became famous, but, but not for, for anything related to open source. This, this is what ended up happening to that kid. It's, it was m and It's the hair, the t-shirt. That's really where he ended up. So let, let's talk about the, the trends that are going on today as it relates to open source Linux. The, the first big trend we're seeing at the foundation is the economy 
is certainly benefiting Linux. Um, the economic downturn, while it's tough for all of us, is causing people to really rethink how they spend their money, where they invest. It's also typical of a recession that it's accentuating trends that had already exist, existed previous to the recession. And really, open source is benefiting from that in a big way. You know, there are tons of studies out there that show <clears throat> people are increasing not only looking at open source, but really implementing open source in order to save costs during this recession. I think one of the best examples, which just happened about a week and a half ago, uh, is that Red Hat joined the S&P 500. Uh, you know, an open source company now is a part of the S&P 500. It's just a great example of where you know, the economic downturn has uh, kicked some folks out of that world and has brought open source into that world. I think that's going to continue to accelerate the trend towards open source. There's another interesting trend that's going on that I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today that really affects something I think a lot of people are interested in when it comes to open source and Linux, and that's you know, the desktop, mobile handsets, the client side of uh, open source and Linux. It's interesting, I think, to most people because it's something you can touch, it's tangible, you use it every day, it's something everyone can relate to. And there's a big trend going on in the industry around uh, uh, convergence. And I think most people are familiar with this, but um, in short, it's the idea that uh, phones are starting to look a lot more like PCs, and PCs are starting to look a lot more like phones. Uh, and that's going to have real ramifications on how the whole PC and mobile phone industry do business. And uh, it's going to have a uh, real opportunity for uh, open source in that world. So let's take a, a look at that trend. Next slide, please. So to, to give you an example of what that trend looks like, it, it's worth, again, looking back to about when that commercial was made uh, to look at the kind of PC that people were typically carrying around uh, at that time. Uh, I think around back, th back then, I had uh, this particular PC. It was a ThinkPad T20. It was one of the better PCs you could get during the day. It had a you know, decent uh, processor. Uh, at that time, it was a reasonably uh, good-sized hard drive. Uh, it had a VGA monitor. Uh, the battery wasn't very good, and it was like $1,000, right? I also had a cell phone at that time. It was uh, one of the better ones uh, out there, the flip phone. Remember when the flip phone was actually cool? Sorry for any Motorola people in the, in the room. Uh, you know, and that really offered very limited services, voice telephony, caller ID. I had to pay five bucks a month for caller ID. Uh, it also had a crappy battery, uh, and uh, I got it for free uh, with a wireless plan of 200 minutes a month, and I paid $70 a month for that wireless plan. Let's fast forward today to what are the, uh, the hot phones in the market. I'll start with the phone. I'm, I'm actually carrying a a Google a G1, but I figured I'd choose the uh, Apple iPhone since that's one of the hotter phones in the market today. Uh, if you look at what the iPhone has, it looks pretty similar to that PC, right? Pretty much the same kind of processor. It's got more storage. It's got a better uh, screen. It's got more capability. Um, it uh, still has a crappy battery. That seems to be the theme over time. Someone's got to solve the battery problem. Uh, and uh, it's significantly cheaper. It's about uh, $300 for the, this is for the new uh, 3GS. Now that's a, the subsidized price. I think you can get it unsubsidized for something like five, $600, but it, it's certainly cheaper than the, uh, than the ThinkPad uh, was back then. Um, what's more interesting though is to look at the PC that I'm using. An HP Mini 1000, nice processor in it. Uh, it's got uh, uh, plenty of storage. It's got built-in uh, Wi-Fi Bluetooth support. Um, it's got a full software productivity suite to work. It's cheaper than the iPhone. Unsubsidized. The, I'm sure the pr production bill of materials on this is much cheaper than it, it is to build an iPhone. The, the most interesting thing here is that the PC in this case is now actually cheaper than the phone. And that's really going to change the economics in the way that the PC industry behaves and it's also going to change the way the phone industry behaves. So this is what's happening. This is this concept of convergence, that these things are starting to look pretty similar. So what do we mean by a desktop in that world where PCs and phones and mobility and tablets are all kind of coming together? Is a smartphone going to be the new big desktop? You know, is the Palm Pre or the Android phone or the iPhone or whatever OS going to be the new 
PC, is that where people are primarily going to use? Is that going to be the new desktop? Are mids, netbooks, net tops, these low cost, small PCs, is that going to be the new major way people interact with the desktop and get onto the internet? Do any of these matter? Next slide, please. Is the browser going to be the new desktop? Next slide. Is QuickBoot going to be the new desktop? How many of you have seen Device VM, Splashtop product? These are the instant on browser. Is that where the new desktop war is going to be? Are televisions going to be the new desktop? Most modern television ships these days uh, are shipped with what we would think of as a computer operating system. Next slide, please. The, the, the point I'm making here with understanding what the next desktop's going to be in this world of convergence is that we don't know what the next desktop's going to be. It's likely going to be all of these things. But when I look through each of these categories, from smartphones, from browser-based OSs, such as Chrome, from any of, you know, set-top boxes, television set operating systems that offer internet connectivity, all of them have clearly one main thing in, in common, and that's Linux. Sony is shipping Linux as part of their television sets. Phone manufacturers are doing this. The big question is, why? Why is Linux uh, a big part of this new emerging desktop, this new converged world? Well, the reason is because convergent changes the way that the PC industry makes money. And so you might ask yourself, hey, I'm an open source developer. Why would I care how the PC industry makes money? Well, because that tends to drive where innovation happens, where financial resources get applied, the way you consume technology, just even as a consumer yourself. So it's worth paying attention to. So let's take a look at sort of where the PC industry has been pre-convergence and where it's headed so we can understand where Linux and open source fit in. This is sort of the typical economics of, the, of today's and sort of yesterday's uh, PC ecosystem. You have ISVs who sort of get a free ride here, right? All the developer tools are free. It's free to offer your applications on Windows or Mac OS X or Linux or any major PC platform that's out there. The OS vendor uh, usually will go and sell their software to a device maker, an OEM, such as Dell or HP or Lenovo. Um, they'll sell that at a fixed price, and that's how most people get their their operating system is through uh, a prepackaged deal with the device maker. The device makers just pass the cost of that operating system software through to the consumers. You buy a Mac or a Windows machine or a Linux box, um, and you go and get your applications directly from the ISVs and so forth. This is, I think pretty much everybody understands this model. This is how the PC industry really works. And there's many more subtle nuances to this, and we could go in great detail in each of these categories, but just in general, at a high level, this is how it works. Well, if we go to the next slide, this is where the industry is, is going. This is where the real future is. And what's interesting here is this, uh, set, this sort of multi-sided set of economics is very similar to the mobile phone industry. And it's really, you're seeing this start to emerge today with mobile internet devices, netbooks, net tops, and smartphones, where application and content providers are now not necessarily guaranteed a free ride. What if uh, tomorrow Microsoft announced, we're taking 30% of all of Adobe's gross revenue for every product they sell on Windows? We're just taking 30 points. It would be huge news, right, just shocking. But that's really what app stores are doing today, is really changing the way in which money changes hands in this ISV, OSV, you know, hardware, OEM, consumer equation. And so application providers in the future, in particular in the smartphone industry already with the iPhone example, aren't getting a free ride. You're given 30 points to the operating system vendor and the, and the OEM, of which Apple is both in this case, and trading money back and forth that way. Now you get some benefits, you get some, some distribution there. Um, the software vendors, in the case of, uh, of Microsoft, they're still playing the game of passing royalties uh, to the device makers, so the device makers still have to buy Windows. 
the, but there's a new character in this economy, which is the network operators. In the future, if a PC, like that HP Mini 1000 I showed, is less than a phone, why wouldn't we see less cost to build than a phone? Why wouldn't we see the same kind of characteristics that we're seeing that we saw in the mid-90s in the US in the mobile phone industry today in the PC industry? And, and what we saw in the mid-90s in the mobile phone industry was phones were free. What really grew and, and built the mobile phone industry, made it take off at a consumer level, was free phones. I worked at a wireless carrier in the mid-90s. Every time we wanted to jack up our sales, we'd give more free phones away. And it worked every single time. And so network operators in that case now become an intermediary between the consumer and the OEM, the device maker, in terms of purchasing PCs. The reason is because they'll pick a model, they'll subsidize it if it costs 200 bucks to make a PC. They know if they get 50 bucks a month per subscriber for a two year lifespan of that subscriber, they can afford to give the PC away for free because they're gonna make money over the lifetime value of that customer's contract, right? And that very much changes the way that PCs are purchased and distributed. Particularly because the internet demands, sort of the, the usage of, of PCs, the, the internet demands that PCs really always be on. You know, it's, it's just really, you don't use your computer unless it's connected. And so network providers provide some legitimate value here and they become legitimate players. Um, and I'm gonna show you a little later some examples of where this is already happening in Europe and where it's about to happen in the United States. And consumers, in terms of the way they get their software, they really can only get them, for, on the iPhone example, through one source. It's through the App Store or through iTunes. It's the only place you can get software for this particular device. This is a big, you know, bill, is it a billion applications sold? It's a huge economy. Uh, every, every other day I see an announcement for somebody else having an App Store. Everybody's gonna have an App Store, I assure you. And that's really gonna change these economics here, right? Because now the consumers are purchasing through the app store, the software platform provider is charging a royalty, the ISVs no longer get a free ride. Uh, in the case of Google, they're sort of even further changing the economics in the Google marketplace, the Android marketplace, they actually give the 30% cut from the ISV, instead of keeping it themselves at Google, they actually give it to the network provider to give them an incentive to sell Android devices on their networks and so forth. So, and I could go down 50 other nuanced versions of how this is really changing the way that money is passing hands all over here. Um, but the, the big question here is, where does Linux and open source fit in here? Why is this an opportunity for Linux? You know, why wouldn't Windows, everybody just, you know, when Win 7 comes out here, everybody just buy Windows 7 PCs, they can be just as easily subsidized and so forth, why is that uh, why is this new economics gonna change that landscape? Why is this an opportunity for Linux? Well, let's take it just one angle here to show you how it's gonna change. And let's look at it from the device maker's angle. So in sort of a Microsoft world, uh, the, the, you know, we saw the old way Microsoft uh, economics worked, but in Microsoft's perspective in this new world where they fit in, if we go to the next slide, the Device makers, when they don't have their own operating system or a more flexible operating system, in this value chain, they're very tightly locked in to a high volume, low margin business here. In particular, they, if they're dependent on a closed software platform to deliver products to market, they have a tougher time competing and they have even tighter margins because Remember, they're trying to get products to a network provider very cheaply so that the network provider can affordably subsidize them and bring them the kind of volume they want. The OS provider in this case, and you can pick Microsoft or Apple or anyone, they're making all this money off of the App Store fees, the 30%, and that's only gonna get bigger. They're the, they're the linchpin, they control what applications go on and off their platform. They don't like your app, you're not on. It's a huge linchpin in this equation that that closed OS platform controls now. It really boxes these device makers in. And you can use these scenarios across any of these players here, but the device makers sort of have a tough time here. So let's look at a device maker that says, I'd like to use an open source 
platform based on Linux where I've got a little more flexibility. Where I can actually ship, instead of Windows on my PC that I'm shipping as an OEM, I can ship an Acer or an Asus operating system, my own EEPC operating system. I can actually offer my customers my own app store. I can actually participate in that 30% commission for applications sold across my device. I actually have a lot more flexibility now if I control my own OS destiny to make a lot more higher margin money here. And so when you look at any of these scenarios about how you achieve more flexibility, Linux is perfectly suited because you don't necessarily have to pay royalties as a device maker in this case. You usually work with a service provider to productize Linux and take it to market. But you've got just so much more flexibility in any of these scenarios to actually make higher margin real money and not be locked and relegated down. And I can run the same scenario for network operators. I can run this same scenario for just pure play OS providers. The point is these economics have changed and people are gonna need flexibility to address this in order to meet this new economic dynamic. And that is why today, even though there's not a ton of these Linux devices in the market yet, you are going to see a ton of them because all of these guys realize, all the players in this economy realize that they need to address this new dynamic and they realize that Linux and open source are uniquely suited to get them there. They're not locked into a Redmond brand. They're not locked into a third party's pricing system. They're not locked out of markets. They will use Linux. They're already using it today. You will see these devices by Christmas time. You will see new app stores coming out. This is going to happen. And the net beneficiary here really is Linux and open source because of the fact that it's shared technology, has flexible licensing, branding, low cost, et cetera. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about convergence, but the one thing I want to underscore across this convergence market is you know, I, I always talk to people about like, you know, when we talk about open source, we shouldn't talk about it being cheap. Like, nobody likes to hear that word, you know, if the cheap isn't good. Let me tell you guys, in this case, for Linux and for open source, cheap is awesome. And let me show you a great example of that. There's another company that's out there uh, running advertising about lower cost PCs. So if we could just cue that up, next slide. This is Jean Paolo. He told us he wanted a laptop with portability, battery life, and I'm looking for power. For under $1,500, we told him, you find it, you keep it. I'm going to buy a laptop. I'm technically savvy. I know what I want. I like a computer that allows me to customize. What's the biggest hard drive that you can get? I like the fact that it has a little camera. This one has a 2 gigahertz processor. Let's see what else we can find. Let's go check out the Max. This is so sexy. But Macs to me are about aesthetics more than they are the computing power. I don't want to pay for the brand. I want to pay for the computer. What would have the best battery life that can still accommodate my needs? This keyboard is small. I have really big hands. But that thing is gigantic. <laughs> it's got four gigs of RAM. It's got the processing speed that I need. It's a pretty strong contender. 512 dedicated graphics card, four gigs of RAM, 1099. This laptop has got everything I want. Oh. <laughs> nice work, G. It's a PC. My budget was $1,500. This computer will do everything that I need. You can't beat that. I'm feeling great. See? I'm a PC because I'm really picky. In all fairness, you know, IBM got their ad, Microsoft gets theirs. I wonder what I can get for $1,500 running Linux. See, it's, we're not the only ones who are thinking about free here or cheap. Uh, so I kind of did that mental exercise. We'd skip on to the next. Uh, $1,500 for Linux. Let's see what we can go ahead and get here. The first thing I can get, I apologize, my, uh, my remote here is malfunctioning. The uh, first thing we can get is that HP Mini 1000, 250 bucks you can order on HP's website today. The second thing I got was an Android device. I got the G1, 99 bucks. I got it with a service plan. I think it's like 200 if I, if I don't get it subsidized. I also got a big screen TV running Linux. It was $499, surprisingly cheap. I was amazed at how cheap I could get a 42-inch big screen TV. 
Uh, it actually uh, has a, a computer inside of it. I got a DVR because I got to have uh, my shows on demand. So I went and got a Neros Linux-based uh, DVR. Uh, that was about 150 bucks. Um, I got, uh, in addition to that, a full set of software productivity tools on my uh, PC, a full office productivity suite. Couldn't get that on my uh, Windows uh, PC. Instant messaging, I got a Photoshop uh, application in, in GIMP and FSpot. Um, and because I had a lot of money left over of that $1,500 budget, I was actually feeling pretty generous and I wanted to help others. So the last thing I bought was a uh, one laptop per child for myself and I, of course, one went to a child in poverty as well. This is what you get for 1500 bucks with Linux. So if we go to the next slide, please. The, the point is, in less than 12 months, it's not just going to be the software that's free. The hardware is going to be free. That's awesome for Linux. That's awesome for open source. You're going to walk into AT&T Wireless you're gonna, or, or, or any network provider. You're going to pick up a free PC. You're going to get a network data plan. You probably already have one, but you'll pour it over to this, and it'll be free. And that is awesome for Linux, because as the price of PTs, the pressure to get those prices lower and lower and lower to expand this demand curve to meet whole new markets that's perfectly suited for Linux. There's no better example of that than yesterday's earnings call from Microsoft where they had their first net decline in income ever. And that is because price pressure that is coming from this phenomenon that I just explained to you. This is an advertisement from AT&T, just to prove that uh, this is actually happening today. AT&T uh, announced, I think, about a week ago that they're going to be offering these netbooks on a nationwide basis, subsidized through the carrier. I think they're 50 bucks. But you get the idea. This is only the very, very beginning of this trend. And it is great for Linux. Next slide, please. The interesting thing about this idea of things being really, really cheap is, and that cheap is good, really accentuates the trend that it's no longer hardware and packaged software that people care about when they go get these devices. It's really services. You know, Google can have Chrome OS on a cheap laptop in a browser-based medium and can subsidize that forever and charge nothing for it because Google makes all its money growing the size of the internet and offering more ads, right? So cheap PCs are great for Google because they're in the services business. And so is Netflix that is killing it in the recession, offering Netflix on demand. The App Store from uh, Apple is a form of a service. Nokia has their OV service. Hosted software, things like Salesforce.com are really driving the whole software industry into a services model. The whole industry, the hardware guys, the software guys, they all realize that they need to move towards this services model. And again, the net beneficiary in a move towards services where the requirement to offer services at a good margin is low cost infrastructure and software, Linux and open source once again meet that demand perfectly. There's no third party you need to enter into a random contract with, the stuff is freely available, you can brand it however you want, you can price it however you want. It's a, it's a tremendous advantage that open source and Linux has in the marketplace. So that's the good news, but it's not all pretty. We have some challenges in front of us, and I thought I would just explore a few of those challenges today just to get you all thinking about this. I don't want to be the uh, complete Linux shill here, right? You know, everyone accuses the executive director of the Linux Foundation of saying things like, you know, if there's a hurricane, I'll say something like, well, you realize that most weather forecasting software runs on Linux, so hurricanes are actually good for Linux. It doesn't matter what it is. I, it's always Linux is good, right, is, is what Jim Zemlin always says. But there are challenges, and we need to meet those challenges, and uh, the community and the industry is working to do this. The first uh, challenge that we have uh, that I think is obvious to most people is standards. The great thing about Linux is that anybody can call any kernel-derived computer operating system or device operating system Linux. 
the thing that's kind of tough about Linux is anybody can call any kernel derived operating system on any, any device Linux. And, and what happens is you get something like this. Next slide, please. It doesn't work that well. And so a big challenge for Linux to be viable in this market is to create platforms that have a set of commonality so that they can benefit from the network effect that really creates a good PC or client economics or mobile device economics. Uh, and Windows is a great example of this. Their biggest power is that there's tons of people using Windows and uh, therefore lots of application developers want to offer their products to those, uh, those Windows users. Uh, and that network effect creates this natural monopoly we have today, uh, which, which is Windows. Uh, Linux today is sort of in the beginning stages of creating standards across different categories of computings so that the same network benefits can apply but you can get all the benefits I just described of more branding flexibility, more flexibility in terms of the business models you create in order to charge the various participants in that marketplace. Um, some, of those challenges, or some of those standards are being created by our organization uh, in the Linux standard base. Uh, we're working on the Moblin project to use those same standards so that Moblin based devices uh, will all function and take advantage of a set of uh, common applications. But the same thing's going on in other versions of Linux. Uh, the Palm Pre is trying to create their uh, standard. Android is obviously creating their standard uh, middleware components and so forth. I am not quite sure how this shakes out over time in terms of who ends up winning and losing in this, this, this sort of consolidation of, of, of standardized Linux uh, offerings out there. What is really clear is that the Linux is, kernel is going to be the common layer for all of them. There's really nothing that's going to displace the Linux kernel. There's just, it's supported on too many uh, architectures, chip architectures, too many devices support it. It's just almost impossible to recreate that component of it. Where we're still seeing things shake out is in that sort of application API layer in terms of creating these standards. So, Check out some of the cool things that are going on in this world uh, uh, around these standards, the Linux standard base, the Moblin project, uh, things that Google and others are doing, and you'll kind of get an idea of where this is shaking out and why this is a challenge. I'm a big believer that we should have a set of industry standards that are open, where you can have uh, multiple versions of a particular consumer operating system that levels that playing field. I think ISVs will love that. Uh, everyone's going to love that except for Microsoft, right? Because what they would prefer is to have a de facto standard that they control and that allows them to set all the marketplace rules. So that's challenge number one. If we can move on to challenge two. Uh, challenge, we'll call it an opportunity. Uh, a unified defense. This is something I want to talk a little bit about uh, today. If we can go to the next Legal issues still continue to be an important aspect of free software. When I first started years and years ago uh, working in open source with open source engineers, I'd come from a, a networking and proprietary software background. I couldn't believe how much engineers in the open source world spent their time talking about legal issues. It's just, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, these guys are all amateur lawyers. It's amazing to me. And it took me a while to figure out that this stuff is actually important and worth talking about. And that the developers who I kind of scratched my head as, why are they all trying to be Perry Mason, were actually right the whole time, that it's worth paying attention to this. And some of the challenges that I want to point out to you around a unified legal defense for Linux or for open source are around things like patents uh, that I think are continue to inhibit innovation. Um, and we have been participating in a few things that you might not all know of, but you should know of, that will help meet the challenge of uh, legal issues as they present themselves in open source. The good news here is we've sort of overcome major legal hurdles for Linux and most open source things. The SCO lawsuit has pretty much died away. That was a big FUD campaign. Um, you know, the GPL has been validated. I think the Microsoft announcement uh, this week, is, it, it does sort of say 
this is, you know, for the last holdout, this is a legitimate form of, uh, of licensing and copyright. But we can still do work to improve things like patents. Dave Kapos, who came from IBM, is now designated to head up the USPTO, uh, which is a great sign because he was involved in creating a lot of the things that I'm showing you today, peer-to-patent, post-issue, peer-to-patent, and so forth. Uh, that's a good sign that there's a new administration in town and that we have a great opportunity to raise the quality of patents in the marketplace. You can all help in doing this. The way you can do that is by participating in some of the programs that I'm showing here today. By participating in things uh, like defensive publications. How many people here have heard of a defensive publication? A few folks? Okay. So in order to get better quality patents, it's good to give patent examiners access to prior art. I think we all get that. And what a lot of companies typically do who have a lot of money is, uh, you know, if they want to have their own defensive portfolio, they'll sit around, they'll come up with patents, they'll file them with the Patent and Trademark Office, they'll be uh, there accessible to the examiners, um, and that sort of gives them a defensive patent strategy. The open source community can do a similar exercise with defensive publications without necessarily going through the timely cost and expense of filing a patent. Defensive publication is an easy way to make the USPTO aware of your innovative ideas. Uh, if you go online and look up defensive publications, the Open Invention Network, the Linux Foundation, organizations like the SFLC, the, we stand by to help you guys out with this process so that you can file these, patent, these uh, defensive publications. You're not necessarily filing a patent. It's quick. It's easier. You'll be in the database for the examiners. People will be able to find your art. Nobody else will be able to take a patent out on your idea so you can be assured that not only will your code be shared, but that it can't be patented or stolen by anybody else. It's a great way that the community can sort of raise the bar in terms of our sophistication in dealing with the legal community and really build a stronger collective sharing of technology and ideas. It's working within the system that many of us don't necessarily like to just make things better. It's a challenge, it's an opportunity, it's important. All of these programs, if you haven't heard of them, I urge you to go check them out because they really represent a collective defense against anybody who's against sharing innovation. It's against anybody who's gonna use the legal system to lock people out of innovating for their own selfish gain. That is something I think we're all interested in. I think that's something that people generally agree on, something I urge you all to participate in. The final thing I wanted to touch on today is, while Linux has had tremendous desktop success, which is awesome news, we still got a ways to go. So I got, kind of got a, a good news and, and bad news uh, story about the desktop experience around Linux in particular. Um, the, good news, the good news is that about four or five months ago at the Linux Foundation, our phone system started kind of going nuts. It was so weird. Like the phone, you, you may find this hard to believe, but we don't get a lot of calls at the Linux Foundation oddly enough, or previously we hadn't. No one wants to talk to me. That's why I'm the last guy on the keynote day. <laughs> I'm the, exactly, at least I get extra time to talk. Um, but then the phone started ringing, like six months or so, weird, right? And the calls started coming in with a common theme. At first, we were so open that we would just direct people directly to uh, individuals at the organization's cell phones. So I'd be getting these calls, I'd be in Tokyo, it's 2 a.m., somebody's calling me up with, with, with one of these. And it just, we finally just had to push them all to voicemail because uh, it started becoming, uh, the volume started becoming quite high. I'd like you all, so that's good. I think that's good because people are really interested in Linux. But it's not that good because I want you to listen to uh, a couple of these calls. Good evening. I am new to uh, computers, and I recently uh, 
purchased a AMD with uh, Linux uh, Ubuntu or something along that line uh, installed, and I cannot seem to connect to the internet. Uh, I'm not sure which department or whatever to speak with, uh, but I am new to this, so bear with me. Uh, I only have dial-up service, and I need some help with that. Poor guy. We called him back. We took care of his dial-up, sir. Yeah. Here's another one. Hi, I hope I have the right number. Um, I was told to give you guys a call. I just bought an HP Mini um, uh, laptop or notebook, and um, I was told to call Linux because I was having um, some difficulties with some of the programs, and um, this is the second one that I've had, so I figured I'd go through you guys. Um, maybe you can give me the proper phone number um, to contact for support. Everyone's trying to get a hold of Linux. It's, we seem to be the place that they call. <laughs> so on a positive note, we get tons of people calling us up saying how much they love Linux. I just wanted to illustrate how it's good and bad that there's this huge new interest coming from a whole new sector of, of you know, computing users uh, that really represent this. And it ties back into a lot of things that I've already been talking about, right? The fact that anybody can kind of call any kernel-derived operating system Linux. What do we mean when we say Linux? And sort of how uh, far we've come, but how much farther we need to go to make sure that uh, this comes true, that really anybody can use Linux. I think that this is going to naturally happen, that Linux is going to improve mainly because um, people are productizing this. There's going to be real resources, real engineers, real user interface design uh, work all put behind this. But there's still ways that we can all participate in some awesome community projects to make the Linux desktop experience even better. And I wanted to highlight just a few of those to you today so that you're aware that uh, this is an issue and that there's still a lot of places that you can go and actually affect the Linux desktop experience directly. By participating in any of these projects, I am positive I missed like 300 projects here that you should be participating in, but I just wanted to highlight a few to remind people that you can go participate in these projects, give feedback, and help improve the Linux desktop. The GNOME Foundation is doing awesome stuff. Stormy Peters and the whole group on the board of the GNOME Foundation are doing great work to make the user experience on Linux better. The KDE guys are doing it. Nokia has a project called MIMO that they're doing it. At the Linux Foundation, uh, at, with the Moblin project, you have a new 3D animation framework, a new netbook-specific and mobile internet device-specific operating system that really raises the bar on usability for Linux. And you can participate in that project today at moblin.org as a developer. Ubuntu is doing awesome stuff, or whatever that Ubuntu is called. Uh, <laughs> Fedora is doing great stuff. There's tons of ways to participate, but just you know, when you go participate, remember remember those calls we're getting at Linux uh, about uh, how we can improve things. Let's make connectivity easy. Let's make the experience easy, uh, and I think that everyone will benefit uh, from that. So. We'd love to have you all join us at the Linux Foundation as well to help. We have a new individual membership program where uh, you can join the foundation. You get your own uh, gym at your name at linux.com email address. We'll give you a t-shirt, discounts on all sorts of cool things. It's on our website, so we'd love to have you guys all come in. We want to make sure that the foundation has a huge, huge array of members from all over the world, give them a little bit to help promote and protect Linux. Uh, so that our organization can be around for the life of Linux, which is going to be for another 30, 40 years. Operating systems last a long time. Linux is an important one. We're at the very beginning, because of this change in PC and mobile device economics, of Linux really on the ascendancy. So let's all join together and make sure that it's protected legally, that we promote it, that we make it better, uh, and it's going to be for the betterment of everyone in terms of new shared innovation. So thank you very much. With that, I have a few minutes for uh, Q&A. Thank you.
Yeah, we have um, about five minutes for Q&A. So if anyone got a question, you'd like to come up to the microphone. I got a question while uh, folks are thinking. One thing that struck me was that um, with everything you're talking about, the kind of the control points on software are, are changing. And you, you, know, you mentioned one of those areas is, is standards. Another one that struck me was services. And um, it seems to me we, we, we're kind of having to look maybe beyond the kernel now as well. And as open developers start learning, um, you know, you know if we, we should be using the, a, the uh, AL, AGPL rather and so on. Yeah, I don't really have an opinion on, uh, so I, the AGPL is everyone, this is the uh, Faro GPL license. It's basically a hosted software license where uh, if a hosted uh, application uh, uses that license and you use their code, even as a hosted offering, uh, you need to, to publish that, that code, right? That's the Faro yeah. license you're talking about. My position on licenses is that it's really up to the developer. Whoever writes the software, whoever comes up with it, whoever owns that copy, that, that they can choose whatever license they want. And so for people who really believe in that, who believe as we move towards a services economy, that those services, you know, websites or whatever uh, should be shared in terms of the code itself, I think they should, should definitely do that. But I don't purport to prescribe that uh, to any particular developer. What the foundation in particular wants to help with when it comes to these type of decisions is provide education about the ramifications of choosing any particular license, what the common practices are, what the common uh, uh, language that they can use so that we don't get 10,000 different licenses. You know, generally, the current set of commonly accepted open source licenses generally fit most cases that developers want to use today. Okay. Thank you. So, your question, please. Hi. Um, I'm from Florida, and I'll say that Linux shorts out just as quickly in seawater as Windows does, so hurricanes are not good for any operating <laughs> system. I'm with you. But my question really is, when you say, where's the next desktop, and you're talking about the desktop, I wanted, I wanted to know, what, how do you define desktop? I'm hoping you don't mean desk, because I despise mine, and I would much rather, not be, work, I would much rather be working at somewhere besides a desk. Yeah, you should come to work at the Linux Foundation then. <laughs> All you need is an internet connection. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to, I don't know what it's going to be. That, that's, I think, the key thing is we have yet to figure out what that new form factor is. You know, Apple really, when they came out with the original Newton, which I have to admit sucked, uh, they were coming out with a new form factor and then it evolved to Palm and there was this sort of Palm device and then that became a big new type of device, and then that morphed into smartphones now. And we're going through that same machination. I'm not sure where we're going to land there. Is it going to be a tablet? You know, is it going to be a, a netbook? Is it going to be just like the past with PCs? I don't know where that desktop's going to be, but I do know one thing, and this is the important part, which is your concept of not being tethered to a desk. Mobility is the, the common denominator across that new desktop. Mobile access to the internet anywhere at any time is the requirement for the future. And so, no, you probably won't be locked down to a desk. You'll probably be able to get the data you want on your TV, on your phone, on your PC, wherever you want. Well, and for me, the, for me the desktop, I guess, has always represented where the work, the core work, is really getting done. So maybe it has more to do with um, the ability to actually get some work done as opposed to just uh, an accessory where you can check your calendar or something like that. That's absolutely right. And what has changed that is broadband access, the internet, the ability to sort of do your work anywhere at any time, exchange documents. The work is really happening in the cloud online, and that's really changing this idea of what a desktop is. And the great thing is, again, Linux wins in that case because as the desktop becomes sort of in the backdrop there, obviously the low-cost, open, free solution is the best one. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you kindly for a great presentation. I just want to bring a point that maybe you can explain how, how to address this issue. I know, for, for example, Toshiba, when they sell a laptop, even if you don't have an, an OS on it, they pay a royalty fee to Microsoft, even if it's OS-less. So the question being is that obviously there's a tax there, even if you don't buy the product just from a licensing perspective. So how do you view that 
you know, which your suggestion is, which I agree with, uh, going forward, how do, you, how do you see that being broken? Because if that's not broken, then the average person basically is paying whether they buy it or not. I have extremely good news for you. I have been to Taipei. I have been to China and Japan and Korea and all parts of the world. Oh no, Sam Ramji from Microsoft, my next guy. So I'm, after I pan Microsoft, I'll take a question from them. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the good news here is that uh, that's happening organically, that OEMs have realized what I just explained here. Heck, my, Microsoft has even realized that they need to move to a services business. They, that's why they're doing Office Online. That's why they're doing Bing. That's why they're doing hosted uh, SharePoint and so forth. But what is happening is that OEMs are no longer saying, yeah, I'm willing to pay a high price for an operating system, uh, and I'm going to pass that cost as a tax off to anyone who buys any of my computers, because now they have options. Now Linux is a viable, legitimate alternative that they can use to negotiate pricing. Even if something like Chrome OS fails completely, the legitimacy of Google and the Linux platform that's represented there gives negotiating leverage that lowers the cost of a PC. That is just fact. You, you look at Microsoft's earnings yesterday to give that example. So the good news for you is that is uh, that tr what you've described is really part of the past. It is not going to be a part of the future. There's going to be a lot more options out there as this convergence takes place. There's going to be some winners. There's going to be some losers. Uh, but there's not going to be that same consistent sort of what you characterize as a tax in the future. With that, Sam. <laughs> hey, Jim. Sam Ramsey, Microsoft. I just wanted to say thank you to the Linux Foundation for enabling the last holdout to participate with Linux and the GPL in a productive way. So thank you. No problem. We, so it's, fu it's funny that Sam mentions, it, for years, if you go on the Linux Foundation website, there's a whole section on how to write device drivers for Linux. And we sort of juxtapose, here's the Windows model, and they have a stable API, and you can go build your binary blob on your own. Here's the, the Linux model. You have to participate in the kernel community. And there's good things in both sides. They're just different. And we've spent so much time educating device manufacturer after device maker after device maker on how to participate in this community. And so Microsoft's participation this week in that process really helped us out in just free advertising to uh, show the last few holdouts that are out there to get their drivers into the main line how to do it. So we appreciate it as well, Sam. Thank you. That's great. I think I'll take a last question. Thanks. Uh, well, this isn't actually a question. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that five years ago today, uh, Alex Martelli and I got married. We read the Zen of Python at our wedding, and the next morning we flew to o OzCon in Portland. So happy anniversary. All right. Congratulations. That's a perfect way to end. It's, I have Thank nothing you, more to add. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.